Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jen and Dr. Sharps, for your introduction. Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. Um, it is a great honor to attend this edition of G20 Interfaith Summit in Istanbul, a city that, was, um, that has witnessed countless conquering and conquests, and among which has breed a rich tradition of cross-cultural and interfaith dialogues. It is a truly humbling experience to be amongst so many amazing individuals who are working tirelessly to bridge gaps and reconcile conflict. As a first speaker of this panel, I would like to begin with a word of thanks to the summit organizers for dedicating a panel specifically on the role of spiritual or religious capital in China's economic development. During the last two decades, there has been a surge in scholarly interest in religions in mainland China, which despite of the rapid shift from a planned economy to a state capitalism, has remained an officially atheist country exercising tight control on religious activities. It is therefore timely and important to give particular attention at this occasion to interfaith relations in China, addressing the contentious issue of religious freedom. China has undergone tremendous social, economic, and cultural changes since the 1980s. These changes combined with the ideological vacuum left by the collapse of faith in communism and the shattered traditional Confucian moral system have led to what termed by many as a spiritual crisis in China, the root cause of rampant social vice. In the midst of the growing concerns about this crisis, all kinds of religions resurfaced and revived. Recent studies show that the number of Chinese who exhibit some sorts of religiosity is multiplying at an unprecedented level. Despite the fact that some of the growth is a result of the change of methodology in survey studies, the fact that much of the growth is found among the younger population suggests that there has indeed been a religious revival in China since the reform began. Protestantism in particular has gained such strong momentum in China um, that China is projected to become a country with the largest number of Christians by 2050. Accurate or not, this, uh, there is no doubt that religion can no longer be dismissed as irrelevant or secondary in scholarly research on Chinese society and policy making in China. It is within this context that I will turn to my study on the role of religion in establishing, maintaining, and developing social trust in business activities, linking the two seemingly contradictive variables together to show that religion is beneficial rather than destructive to China's economic development. Before moving forward, I think it is important to explain why I say that religion and business seem to contradict each other, at least in the Chinese context. The traditional Chinese society is based on primarily um, agrarian economy in which merchants and traders were despised because frequent travels would cause instability in the family life and their activities were deemed as a threat to morality and social order. Business is perceived or understood as worldly activity devoid of sacred meaning, a businessman or woman seeking to minimize the cost and maximize the profits may be perceived as cunning, greedy, deceiving, manipulative. Right? A religious person, in contrast, is supposed to pursue a holy and spiritual life that does not focus on immediate reward in this life. This distinction drawn between business activities and religion has become more pronounced in China today, as many would rather become rich than pursuing professions um, instilled with certain moral principles, such as teacher and clergy. Self-centered rational calculation typical in business certainly does not seem to be compatible with, an, with the altruistic, irrational decisions typical in religion. As China con continues to liberalize its market to maintain sociability, religion needs to be brought in dialogue with business so that business activities are no longer meaningless and business people hitless. Now, since I published my book on immigrant Muslims in post-9-11 American society back in 2014, I have embarked on a new project uh, exploring the transnational Chinese Muslim business networks between China's booming economic um, business centers along the southeast coast and then trade hubs in the Arabian Gulf, particularly the United Arab Emirates and its, glo its rising global city, Dubai, which is greatly facilitated by my location right now. 
So this project builds on my earlier study on Chinese Muslims' attitude toward business, published in Social Compass back in 2010. In the past several years, I have met and interviewed many Muslim business people, entrepreneurs, scholars, clergy, and even cutters in Beijing, Zhengzhou, Guangzhou, Yiwu, Xi'an, Yinchuan, and Dubai, just to give you a visual image of the places that I've um, conducted my research, just showing you a map. Um, you'll see um, I've been, um, I, I, uh, my research sites um, actually spread across China from the north in Beijing and in the middle, Zhengzhou and the south in Guangzhou and also China's um, a thriving commercial center of Yiwu on the east coast and also in the west, and which I could not actually mark out. I'm not very good with those um, tools, but I'll figure out how to do that when I publish my work. Um, and now, um, I've also conducted a lot of uh, interviews eh, with uh, business people, Muslims, in particular in Dubai, and um, that is uh, uh, the, the upcoming global city in the Middle East. Um, in this study, I seek to understand whether Islam generates interpersonal trust and influences institutional trust in business activities in China's emerging market economy. My argument that religion is beneficial rather than destructive for China's economic growth is largely based on findings from these studies. The reason that I focus on Islam was largely due to the very different attitude toward business activities in Islam than that found in traditional Chinese culture. Business people may be seen as cunning and calculative and of low level morality in the eyes of ordinary Chinese, but in Islam, doing business is a noble act of its own. Located at the junction of Africa and Asia, Arabian Peninsula, where Islam originated, is an important part of the Middle East and played a critical geopolitical role in the international business. Before the revelation of Islam, business activities have already widespread among Arab tribes in the area. Almost all the people living in Mecca and Medina were involved in some sorts of business activities. Wealthy merchants were highly respected and enjoyed prominent positions in society, such as famous Quraysh tribe. The tradition of doing business was not interrupted by the appearance of Islam. On the contrary, business activities grew rapidly because of the detailed guidance and careful regulation over all aspects of business activities offered in the Quran and the Hadith. In Islam, business activities are considered to be socially useful since Islam provides guidance for every aspect of life, business activities are therefore an integrated part of one's religious life. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was involved in trading for a very large part of his life. Not only was him a noble, a noble honest, successful, and well-respected businessman at this time, at his time, the Quran also recognizes importance of material success and enjoyment for human beings. Many teachings in Islam are closely related to economic activities. There are many surah in the Quran that portray trading as a virtuous and desirable profession in which one's faith is efficiently tested in various ways. Islam has a very long history in China, more than a thousand years, actually, um, more accurately, 1,400 years. It arrived in China during the Tang Dynasty with Persian and Arab merchants and the traders. Chinese Muslims inherited this Islamic view on business and attached great value to doing business as a profession, much more than a mere survival strategy. During the Song Dynasty, Muslims virtually dominated the import and export business in China. The office of Director General of Shipping was constantly held by Muslims during this period of time. Because Chinese Muslims have played such an indispensable role in broadening and sustaining China's international trade with Central Asia and Southeast Asia, they have been efficient, effectively named the middle man. Admiral Zheng He, this is an image of him, right? a Muslim himself, is a testament of Chinese Muslims' contribution to China's connection to the world. The status of Chinese Muslims as a middleman, international trade eroded since then due to imperial China's lack of interest in trade, Muslim rebellions, and the subsequent persecution of Muslims during the late Qin Dynasty. The implementation of a planned economy and the overall suppression of religion in mainland China after 1949 further eliminate possible social capital Chinese Muslims may generate. China's treatment of Muslim minorities is highly criticized by Muslim-majority countries, which clearly reflects on China's precarious ties with the Middle East, at least at the social level. Chinese Muslims, nevertheless, have maintained strong professional preference 
toward bitterness. When China began its uh, reform in the 1980s, Muslims, as I found in my uh, study, Muslims were among the first ones to plunge into the so-called uh, commercial sea. Many migrated from Northwest to the Southeast coast to open shops, restaurants, factories, and companies. They soon resumed the status of middlemen in cities like Guangzhou and Yiwu, uh, which now attract a large number of business people from the Middle East. Um, this is a picture of Yiwu, China's largest commercial center on the Southeast coast. Southeast coast. Uh, here is um, a picture of um, um, uh, that I took right after Friday Juma in Grand Mosque in Yiwu. Um, this is a very typical scene these days that you can see on China's southeast coast. In addition, Chinese Muslims have also gained greater mobility and become increasingly transnational in recent years, maintaining business networks across borders. For example, Dubai hosts um, probably the largest Chinese Muslim communities outside China. Uh, I hope I can say that because um, 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 there's really no statistics to show that, but it's clear that Dubai has this um, huge um, Chinese Muslim community. They're quite visible uh, in everyday life. Muslim-owned businesses mushroom in the city, especially within the residential complex near um, Dragon Mart. Um, this is a picture of Dragon Mart. Um, and this, uh, these are two aerial views of the area um, and the residential complex. And it just really give a glimpse of this growing tide between China and um, the Gulf, at least. Um, but I don't really have time to get into all the details. I know I'm running short on time, but I want to draw your attention to the role of religion in building social trust. Um, it is in the sense that religion can be translated into social capital. Uh, trust, a social virtue, has been examined from various perspectives. Analytically, trust has been distinguished into different types, such as interpersonal trust, uh, versus system trust, uh, trust, cognitive trust versus emotional trust, and calculus-based, knowledge-based, and identification-based trust. Trust is not only important to civil society and democracy as suggested by sociologists and political scientists, um, it is also a very essential component in business relations that increases production efficiency and reduces transaction costs. And Chinese business people and state-owned large companies have been in the Gulf since the 1980s. They have made fortunes. However, uh, there's very little meaningful social and cultural interactions between Chinese people and the indigenous people, um, despite the increasing volume of, uh, uh, volume of trade and the growing visibility of Chinese corporations, uh, like um, corporations that we all uh, know uh, these days, Huawei, China's construction company, that builds um, Palm Jumeirah, for example, and Alibaba, so on. Um, so I, in my study, I found that Chinese Muslims play a very important role, often overlooked role, in fostering China's growing econo economic, social, and cultural ties with its Muslim counterparts. Um, even though um, uh, the large companies and then even uh, Chinese government tend to downplay that level of connection, and this has been observed on the social level, um, uh, the Muslims certainly gained more trust um, in their social life, in everyday life, in businesses, and their business flourished, but the, their number is still quite small. Um, but what I'm trying to make, uh, the point I try to make here is that um, their religious identity and the religiosity are part and parcel of social capital. Those capital can help to bridge the gap between China and then the Muslim world through building interpersonal trust and encouraging cross-cultural communications. Um, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, <laughs> two minutes. Okay, that's that, that's great. Um, certainly, um, Chinese Muslims only constitute about probably just ten percent of Chinese expatriates in um, the country that I conducted my research, and I'm still uh, working um, to uh, collect more data um, and um, on both sides of the world, um, partly in China and partly in the Middle East. Um, and then they also, uh, I also noticed that Muslims tend to concentrate in small to medium businesses. I may, it might be an exaggeration to argue that Muslims now all of a sudden become very important um, to the Chinese government's um, Belt and Road Initiative. Right? Um, but I think it certainly cannot be overlooked, um, and especially you know, in the Gulf region. Um, policy, mer um, policy makers um, in China, um, however, are just only beginning to recognize the potential roles Muslim minorities and other religious minorities can play 
in this initiative of Belt and Road. Uh, Chinese diplomats, for example, as I observed, right, and their approach to um, oversee Chinese Muslims remain very rigid um, and very outdated. Right? Um, it's very similar to what's going on inside China. There's lack of consideration for this transnational element in the Chinese Muslim life these days. Um, as I conclude my presentation, um, I'd again like to emphasize that um, a liberal religious policy that truly respects the freedom of religion is beneficial, not destructive to China's economic development. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much.